All right, now comes the part we've been waiting for. Our first speaker tonight is Michelle Merkel. She's co-director of Food and Water Justice, the legal arm of Food and Water Watch, and a board member of Socially Responsible Agriculture Project. And I can't wait to hear what she has to say. All right, I'm gonna try to hold this, although I talk with my hands, so this could be a disaster, but we'll give it a whirl because I like to wander. <coughs> Anyway, good evening, Bayfield, and all the other folks that have come from far and wide. Um, thank you so much for including me in this event tonight. I was really excited to be invited by Mary. I immediately looked up Bayfield on your, the website and was struck by the beautiful pictures that the Chamber of Commerce had on their, on their website, and then was even more struck driving from the airport yesterday from Duluth coming up here. And the, the main question that I kept asking myself over and over was, why would anybody ever want an animal factory to plunk themselves down in this beautiful community. Yeah. I started reading the articles about the Reich's farm, family farm, and he claims he's moving from Iowa to avoid hog disease. And others said, you know, people shouldn't worry about this, it's just one operation. Well, I'm here to tell you with these animal factories, it's never just one operation. So I called my friends in Iowa from the airport and I said, what do you know about this guy? This is a group, Iowa Citizens from, for, uh, for Community Improvement, CCI. And without missing a beat, they said, yeah, I know him. We just fought two new proposals in Howard County. And he's publicly stated that it's his goal this year alone to put 20 more animal factories up in the region, including a couple in Northeast Iowa, the state that he's supposedly running from, some in Southeast Minnesota, and in Wisconsin. So he has a plan. And Lynn Henning, who you meet in a few minutes as well, found that he has about 40 operations that exist in Iowa already, and he has compliance problems. The other disturbing piece of news that I was told was that the port in Superior, Wisconsin, may be turned into the main export terminal to China for Midwestern agricultural products. China, as you probably know, bought our largest pork producing company, Smithfield, last year. They have an insatiable appetite for pork products. They also want things like um, milk powder. So if any of what I'm telling you is true, the targets on your back got a whole lot bigger. So I'm gonna tell you tonight about what could happen if you roll out the red carpet for animal factories. And my goal is not to depress you, but to frankly politicize you and to make you excited about the fight. Because what the good news is, is we have all of these crusaders to my left who have been in the fight in their own communities and elsewhere and who have won, who have worked with communities to keep animal factories out if they don't want them and to help them learn from their, the lessons from their failures so that you won't be defeated. So first I'm gonna tell you how a city girl came to this fight. And I think it's also a cautionary tale part. Oops, for you, it's already on the slides up there. Scott Dye, please stand up, it's his fault. <laughs> Family farmer from Missouri, now factory farm crusader. Approached the EPA, and it was one of my first jobs out of law school. I was working at the Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, D.C. at the headquarters. And a case was brought to me to evaluate for the strengths of its legal claims. And Scott and other citizens in his community asked EPA to join them in a legal fight against two mega hog operations that were polluting their air and water. What I learned from that case was that all over the country, traditional small family farms were rapidly being replaced by huge industrial complexes that crammed millions of animals in buildings where they had almost no room to move and no access to light. The legal term for these operations is concentrated animal feeding operations. You'll often hear them referred to as factory farms, but they're not farms. I try to call them animal factories because there's nothing about this that is farming. That's not animal husbandry, and they're not interested in good stewardship of the land, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's about money. It's a business, a huge business. In hog factories, the animals spend their whole lives on metal grates, and their waste drops to below the buildings in huge pits. In Missouri, it was then sucked out and dumped into huge cesspools that were three and four acres big and 20 feet deep. 
They then suck this toxic brew, and I say toxic intentionally because it's not just waste, it's antibiotics, it's hormones, the chemicals they wash the buildings out with, all of that gets dumped in these pits, and then that waste is sprayed onto cropland as fertilizer, untreated, but USDA studies tell us there's too much manure being produced in our country and not enough land to apply it to as fertilizer, so a lot of it runs off into our waterways. Scott and his neighbors had filed a lawsuit against the two biggest pork producing companies in the country at that time, Premium Standard Farms and Continental Grain. Together, these companies built 21 of these huge complexes in just five counties alone. There were over a thousand buildings, 163 of these huge waste pits. They produced 2.5 million hogs a year that it produced as much waste as a city of 10 million people. That's the waste that's produced by New York City and Philadelphia combined every year. The kicker is that Premium Standard Farms told the community that we're just gonna build one sow operation. Does that sound familiar? We're just gonna build one sow operation. Instead, they built 21 of these huge complexes. The millions of gallons of waste that these hogs produce wreaked havoc on the community. Waste from overflowing pits, waste that ran off of cropland, caused massive fish kills. Toxic gases like ammonia and hydrogen sulfide that come from decomposing waste made people sick. And flies from rat-tailed maggots that blanket the cesspool ruined the community member's way of life. They couldn't open their windows or go outside. And flies are also vectors for disease. EPA was gonna fix this. So we joined the case and we brought Clean Water Act claims and also the first ever claims under some of our federal environmental statutes that are supposed to protect air quality. But in the middle of the litigation, I walked into work one day right after the Bush administration took office and I was told that I had to settle the case or abandon it altogether, drop it, and I had to drop all of the other investigations that they started against CAFOs. And I was stunned, I was furious, but in that moment I learned a very good life lesson. And that justice and fairness aren't a given. You can't sit back. It's something you have to constantly fight for, even when you're dealing with government agencies who man whose mandate it is to protect public health and the environment. And the worst moment in my career was when I flew out from Washington, D.C. to meet with the plaintiffs in a barn in Missouri to tell them the EPA was walking away from the fight. I quit my job over that case, and now I sue them. Because But the sad part is we need more people in this might, not just lawyers, but more bodies. Because things haven't gotten much better in the last 15 years. This is a map that Food and Water Watch produced a couple weeks ago. We updated it based on the latest USDA census data, which is from 2002 to 2012. This is just a screenshot, but it's interactive on the web, so it's pretty cool. You can click on a state, you can see what the profile is for agriculture, how many dairies, how many hogs, how many um, poultry operations. And the red is where the, is the most extreme concentration. What we learned is that in 2012 alone, and we've had more factory farms since, they produce more waste, or 13 times more waste than the entire human population. The number of farms, the number of animals increased by 20%, and the average number of animals per site Increase. This is because we're losing hundreds of family farms, new family farms every day, because there's this pressure to get big or get out so that you can try to compete. The political capture that I'm talking about at the federal level exists also at the state level. And if you don't think that it's gonna happen to you because you trust the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources to have your back, <laughs> think again. Let's look at a local example. I don't know if you can see this, I'm, I'm sorry for those in the back, but this is um, a petition filed by citizens in Kiwani County. They have about 200 dairy farms in the county and about 16 of these large animal factories or CAFOs. And Kiwani County has an extensive and well-documented record of nitrate and bacteria contamination in the regional groundwater aquifer that provides, which is the sole drinking water source for about 95% of the county. A third of the wells tested contain bacteria, nitrates, or both, 
at levels that exceeded state and federal public health standards. In some communities and some townships, it was high as 50%. So-called brown water incidents are common where you turn on your faucet and you get this brown, foul-smelling water that comes out. You can't drink it, you can't bathe in it. This is a public health crisis in your backyard. Nitrate contamination causes serious health impacts. It increases the chances of blue baby syndrome resulting in infant death. It's associated with certain types of cancers and it causes spontaneous abortions. Bacteria as well causes serious illness, gastrointestinal, even death. In fact, antibiotics, 80% of them in this country, including those used for human medicine, are used in the livestock industry, in the factory farm industry, because they have to dose their animals at very low levels in order for them to survive in the filthy conditions that they have to live in. This low dosing of antibiotics has created what we call superbugs, or antibiotic resistant bacteria. And according to the Center for Disease Control, last year they issued a report that said because of the abuse of antibiotics in the industrial agricultural system, we have 23,000 deaths a year, premature deaths. We have over two million illnesses. That means if you're a vegan living in New York City with no proximity to an animal factory, you still need to care because you could get sick or die from antibiotic resistant bacteria because of the abuse in the factory farm system. So how did this crisis happen? Last week, the socially responsible agricultural project, Family Farm Defenders, Kiwani Cares, they focused on those 16 largest operations and found that Wisconsin DNR is putting polluters before the public. The results show that even the largest facilities that DNR thinks are in substantial compliance with their permits have violation after violation after violation with no enforcement action. CAFOs are doing serious damage to families drinking water in this state. Laws are going unenforced and citizen complaints are being ignored. This is the same DNR that's going to permit the Reichs View family farm here. And that operation, in and of itself, by the nature of it, is a threat to you and your drinking water sources. They want to put 24,000 hogs here that produce anywhere from 6.8 to 9 million gallons of waste every year. Unlike Missouri, they're not going to put it in those big pits. They're going to store it underground, they say. And those types of operations have exploded because of the buildup of the methane gas. If they're properly vented, it means all the toxic chemicals go into the air, and there are 19 residences within less than a mile from this operation. And health impacts, serious health impacts, have been documented at much greater distances. They want to truck the waste and spread it on 880 acres. They want to truck pigs to finishing facilities where they grow to their final weight before slaughter. Trucks are vectors for antibiotic-resistant pathogens. Flies are vectors for antibiotic-resistant pathogens and other disease. So if you combine this inherent threat with a DNR that's not showing any real interest in protecting its citizens, like in Kiwana County, you end up being Kiwana Kiwa County or worse. Lynn and Nancy Utesh are here. I'm sure it's hard for them to hear this. They are in the, please stand up and be acknowledged. They are the warriors at the front of this battle in Kiwana County. I'm sure that they'll tell you that your time is now. Do not let it get to a point where you're trying to clean up a mess, your only source of drinking water. Fight this industry from coming in in the first place. So in Missouri, Kiwani County, all over this country, there's a theme here, right? Corporate, there's like this balance of empower between corporations and people. And there's this great quote from Grover Cleveland that indicates this has always been a problem. Corporations which should be the carefully restrained creatures of the law and the servants of the people are fast becoming people's masters. Corporations have their role to play in society, but they shouldn't be our masters. They shouldn't be writing the laws that are supposed to regulate them and that are supposed to protect you. Here's the good news. I think we can reverse this trend. Uh, food Inc. director, I don't know if you've ever read the book or seen the movie, it's a great movie about our food system. 
Um, Robert Kenner has said, people must be transformed from passive eaters to inform shoppers to those who step into the political fray. We've done a lot with education, a lot of people, there's this greater than ever awareness and desire for healthy food, but at the same time we have this rise in factory farms. We need to, with our healthy demand, step into the political fray. And we must work together. Numbers matter to elected officials. A former coll colleague, Brother Dave, used to say, eating is a moral act. If you eat, you have a stake in our food system. And voting with your dollar is important, but we have a two-tier food system. Most people can't afford to eat healthy food, right? Antibiotic-free or you know, hormone-free, organic food. But everyone can engage civilly. Everyone can vote. The good news is there are folks at this table to my left, folks like Mary Dougherty in your community, that have already said they're gonna fight. They just need help. They need money and they need bodies. Lynn's gonna talk to you a little bit about the tools that you can use. I'm just gonna mention quickly a few opportunities before you. Farms Not Factories is mentioned. Sign up tonight. Sign the pledge that says you wanna protect the 10% of your fresh water that lies at your feet and your other wet waterways. Sign a pledge that says you care about your community's public health and the environment, and that you want to hold your elected officials accountable so that they make decisions that are good for your community. Engage your local officials. Get on their agenda for their supervisor, their board of supervisor meetings. Let them know that there's a demand in the community for something different than animal factories. And there's an election in 2016. This should be an election issue. This should be in the media often, the message should be, if you don't make the right decision to protect our community, we're coming for you and you're gonna lose your job. And you need to... <laughs> and you need to thank your supervisors because the fact that you have a moratorium in place is actually amazing. and gives you time and space to figure out your next move to build political power. So thank those that have been on the right side of the issue and find out how you can best support them so they can take this a step farther and keep these facilities out altogether. Finally, you also need to engage those at, that work at their state house because any local control victory you have here, they'll try to take away from you. So you need to talk to people who are lobbying in Madison. And eventually, engage as much as you can at the federal level. You've got a governor. <laughs> reserve my comments about your governor. However, I can say one good thing about him, and that is if he runs for president, he gives you a national platform. You become the truth tellers about what happens under his watch. He should be educating people in Iowa who will work in the caucuses. He should make this issue an issue outside of Iowa and across this country. Take advantage of that national platform. Shine a spotlight in Kiwani County. Shine a spotlight on what's happening in Bayfield. Ultimately, this is a cultural question. Do you want to reject the hijacking of your government by big agribusiness? Do you want to reject the hijacking of your community specifically by Reichs and all the other factory farms that plan to come in behind that operation? Or do you want to keep Bayfield beautiful and you want to find better ways of encouraging economic development, including supporting your true family farmers? today is that you make decisions that your grandchildren and their grandchildren can be proud of. There's this beautiful um, law of the Iroquois Nation that says, in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. It's a beautiful way to live your life, that you have great consideration for your land, for your air, for your water, for your community, so that you're protecting it for the unborn and not just yourselves. Lastly, I just want to say I'm super excited for pie. <laughs> However, I was lamenting last night at the dinner table that I live in Maryland, and on the eastern shore of Maryland, we used to have a lot of fruit and vegetable farmers. A lot of pie. There's not a lot of pie anymore, because a lot of those acres have been converted to corn and soy beans to feed the chicken industry. Purdue raises 500 million chickens on this little strip of land has decimated the Chesapeake Bay, which is literally dying. 
We have so much waste, the state now wants to start stockpiling it on state lands and assign a contract to build an incinerator. They're now gonna put smokestacks up in a rural landscape that now has too many industrial factories. Is that what you want for your community? So my final thoughts are sign up for Farms Not Factories tonight. Sign up tonight, sign the pledge. Tomorrow, start kicking butt with Mary and everyone else in Farm Not Factories. And finally, choose pie and people, including future generations, over big ag profits. And I hope that I'll be back at your victory celebration sometime soon. Thank you so much. Michelle, thank you so much for that powerful call to action. And thank you for being here because your being here is also a call for action. I'm Tina Rickelli, one of the board members with the Alliance for Sustainability, and we're taking just a few moments before our next speaker to invite you to act in a very powerful way as we pass the hat as we pass the hat, literally asking you to consider making a donation to the Alliance for Sustainability. And your contribution, as Christine shared, and also the energy that Michelle brought, it helps to add a voice, your voice combined with ours. Our hat is a hat of hope and action. And so we're excited at the Alliance to be able to engage you in partnership in this financial way as well. You know, I, I always giggle because I'm, I'm of the era where when I hear about a hat, I always think of Rocky and Bullwinkle, and poor Bullwinkle saying, hey Rocky, want to see me pull a rabbit out of this hat? And you know how that always goes. But you see, we're in an incredibly important time and era where we can take that hat, that hat at the, where we're teetering on the edge of that that's that epic that's going to be named after the human species and we can pull out of that hat an amazing reversal and that comes from your action your responding to Michelle's call to action to get involved and also your contribution your adding your voice with our voice at the Alliance for Sustainability now many of you have also expressed an interest in supporting financially as well as action wise with farms not factories and we encourage you to do so and and right outside this door is the booth where we encourage you to make a donation there for farms not factories and also to sign that pledge and get involved and in the meantime we encourage you to support the alliance for sustainability not only with your presence which you're doing right now so powerfully also with your financial vote with our baskets that are going around so thank you so very much okay, okay. Is it on? Is it on? No. It is. okay wasn't michelle great yeah. to Bayfield, Wisconsin. And now, we're gonna be equally well by Lynn. Lynn is, uh, she's so, she works for Social Responsible Agriculture Project. She's their a regional coordinator. She's a Michigan family farmer, and she's the winner of uh, the 2010 Goldman Environmental Prize, which is a really, really prestigious environmental. <laughs> and it's only given to one person on each continent, is that right? Once a year. Can you imagine the field of entries for that award? And she nailed it in 2010. So I can't wait to hear what she has to say. That way I can dodge the bullet. Um, hi, everybody. I thank you very much for having me here. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm a family farmer from Michigan. My husband and I have been married 36 years. We have two children, three grandchildren. We farm 300 acres. We raise our own food and garden. And we've been in this fight for over 15 years. Um, tonight, what I wanna do is I wanna give you a scenario of your future 10 years down the road. 
I'm going to give you a bad scenario, and I'm going to give you a good scenario. And these have already happened in other communities. So I want you to see where you really want to be 10 years from now, because this is what you face one way or the other. So as you know, if I say the word Toledo, it might resonate a little bit with you. My area is upstream, and we are the headwaters of Lake Erie. We have 15 CAFOs. We have 45,700 animals within a 10-mile radius. We are ground zero in the center of all 15. They produce 187 million gallons of liquid waste and 180 million pounds of solid waste. A cow produces 20 times more than that of a human. What we have is equal to the city of Boston in our area that drains entirely to Lake Erie. So the things that we face and we have right now, we have E. coli O157 in surface and groundwater. We have infectious cryptosporidium in the water. We have Giardia in the water. We have antibiotic resistance to five different antibiotics in the water that goes downstream. Two of the towns downstream drink out of this water and they don't know that that's in their water. The algae bloom broke out again last week to start in Lake Erie. It's a month earlier than it was last year. People are already starting to panic. In our area, we have people with breathing problems. We have people with heart problems. My own family has suffered quadruple bypass. My father and mother-in-law were diagnosed with hydrogen sulfide poisoning, which can cause irreversible brain damage, memory loss, anger, and they just lose their vitality when they get this. Um, in the Lake Erie watershed, I'm going to give you just a little broader picture because this would be your entire watershed. There are 10,748,117 permitted animals in that watershed that produce 5 billion pounds of waste that goes into Lake Erie. That's a total number, the overall watershed. And this is our area. We have 57 lagoons within a 10 mile radius of our farm. We have over 4,700 violations by the Michigan DEQ that came down and verified the violations we turned in. When the CAFOs built in our area, there was no permitting system. So they could come in, all they had to have was a well permit. There was no other regulations to cover them. So those are things. And then the impacts of the CAFOs. CAFOs are nothing more, they're a resource extraction industry. They steal and drain the wealth from the communities. They leave behind decreased quality of life, road damage, taxes and abatements that they get from the county and state. You will have property value loss within a mile of these facilities. Well water contamination, health problems, dissension in the community. People for and against will become enemies that were once friends. We have surface and drinking water pollution. We have leaking lagoons. There's cleanup costs. There's disease, viruses, bacteria, and pathogens. And many of the diseases that people have and the people are vulnerable to, many times when they spread the animal waste have to leave their homes. You have to understand that a fly can travel 20 miles after the birth of a fly that can carry disease. You have to understand that foot and mouth disease can go up to a thousand miles. So everyone will be, you know, affected if this has an outbreak of any type of disease. So now I'm going to go through 
our socially responsible ag project. Um, just some strategies for you and the community, and then we'll go through the other case scenario. SRAP, socially responsible ag project, empowers rural communities. We'll help you with tools and help you understand and the devastating health and environmental impacts of CAFOs. We must receive a request for help. We never turn down an SOS, no matter how small it is. We will give information, we will do what we can on the ground. Our goal is it to empower you, the community, to stop the CAFO that's coming in or is in our case to help hold them accountable for what they have done. In our area alone, we have had um, state lawsuits, um, four on one facility, one on every other facility but one. We've shut down three of the big dairies. We've shut down a hog facility. First, we identify what legal hooks are, what and how we can go after, um, and develop an approach for you to go after a war in your community to help fight the CAFOs. And you never give up. This is your children's future and their children's future. And it's your drinking water, your air, and your land that produces food. These are just a few of the tools. We do layouts, we train for water monitoring, we help and provide educational materials, we help with media outreach, we help you organize, and we help you get agency enforcement. These are other proven techniques of joining other groups of fighting CAFOs, uh, water testing equipment, air equipment, uh, fact sheets, you don't have to recreate the wheel. We can provide everything that you could possibly need um, and all the rest that are listed. In Michigan, what I've done is I've taken mapping for agency people, for Congress people, for state representatives, and every one of these dots, you can click on it. It gives the name of the facility, how many animals, all their violations because the state doesn't even have that much information. So these are things that we can do on the ground. We also provide um, aerial photography um, for what we do. Um, we in our area use a company called Lighthawk, who's an environmental flying organization, to do aerial photos. And we've done over 30 flights now, and we've had the state agency up in the plane with us over four times now. We do a lot of on-the-ground pictures and aerial photography that shows practices that are not sustainable. Uh, at the top, uh, people's cars were getting drenched as they were going by the main highway. The bottom left shows application on snow with um, tile risers where the heat, the heat from the sun will heat it up because it's dark on the snow and it will melt and go directly down through the tile lines to the waterways in the wintertime. The, Crop circles on the right is manure through these irrigators. And this is one of the main systems that hog operations use to apply waste. And it creates air pollution and illness because of what's in the waste and the pathogens and the virus are getting airborne. These are on the ground pictures of intentional violations. The top left, they literally dug a trench out of the lagoon to let it overflow to the waterway. To the right, they're letting it overflow out of the hog barn, right down to the waterway. And the bottom one was a lagoon that we shut down that was built between a two wetlands, that when they went in, they were dumping it over the side so it would just drain down to the wetland. These are pictures of violations that we turn into the state and federal agencies. Uh, the top left, we had E. coli in this water at 750 thousand milligrams per liter, which is 300 for full body contact for swimming and a thousand for surface water. 
So people downstream are drinking this water. So the center one was uh, milk laced with antibiotics that they had dumped out the back of the milk house. And then the others, you can see, they had a meltdown on the snow and ice. They applied in winter, and that went clear to Defiance, Ohio, where there was drinking water. The green on the left was silage leachate that went into a lake with 85 homes. Um, the water at that point um, tested really low for dissolved oxygen. We couldn't get any readings below six foot in the water. These are pictures. Uh, the top left is a hydrogen sulfide meter at a hog barn. These are the hog barns we shut down. Um, we were getting seven parts per million. Ten parts per million can deem you unconscious. Uh, to the right, um, I threw that in. That was a lady that had come from Oprah magazine. She'd never been up in a plane. So when they put my article in Oprah, uh, we took her up and let her see for herself. And the bottom left is another pure manure runoff from application on snow. The bottom right is a dissolved oxygen meter that the state uses, exactly the same. Anything below 5.0 will create death in the water. Nothing can survive. Every manure discharge we have always reads below 5. This is what we start out with, with the layout. I know you can't read the fine print on this, but we take the nutrient management plans. We show all the ways that the waste will leave the facility and all the problems. This was an aerial photo showing um, an overflowed lagoon and the cows were drinking out of the lagoon water. This is just a quick example. This was our State University <laughs> Center for Excellence. They applied on snow. It ran two weeks downstream in the waterway. And 25 miles downstream, they had to not pull water for drinking because this kept running. This is one of the things that we're looking at now with Lake Erie, that every time we have a manure discharge, we are getting algae blooms right where the manure is. This is a discharge that is drinking water within two miles of this location for 21,000 people. This location was the big facilities that we helped shut down. These this company, there's over 100 million gallons. There's nine lagoons at this location. And the interesting part about this is they went bankrupt at 55 million for Rabo Bank and 150 million for Agstar. And all the local farmers had to literally sue because none of them got paid. They went bankrupt. So the local farmers were the guys that got hurt the most. Challenges to this. There's no clear performance standards for CAFOs. There's no central database with all the information. As Scott can verify when we scanned all the paperwork at the DNR. Um, there's no clearly defined strategy to protect water and air quality. There's no training of staff for enforcement. We've had staff come down in the field that literally had to borrow water bottles, gloves, dissolved oxygen meters, bottles, anything, because they're not equipped and they're not trained for on-the-ground testing. Um, identification of pollutants of concern. This is a big one because in the manure, they only have to test for phosphorus um, and ammonia, you know, certain things they have to test for. You know, the, the nitrates, aren't tested for, they don't test for the chemicals that are used to clean the barns, they don't test for the antibiotics. So this is all mixed in these lagoons and then spread on the land, as, as Michelle said, untreated. Subsidy elimination. There's a website called ewg.org, which is the Environmental Working Group in Washington. And it has kept running track of subsidies for each state around the country. And these guys literally get money for practices that are not sustainable for what they're doing. 
Elimination of the liquid waste system. We have to go back to pasture-based systems because the liquid waste system is killing the groundwater. As Lynn and Nancy can say in, you know, Kewanee County, that this, the lagoons are meant to leak. The NRCS will tell you that and tell you how much they leak into the ground daily. Um, changing practices and standards that are not adequate to protect public health. I'm on the NRCS Tech Committee in Michigan, and we are now getting groups on the committee that are moving towards more sustainable practices. This is one of the steps you guys can do here, is get on your state technical committee and request that more money go for grazing, more money go for organic farming, and get more to the communities and the young people that need it to get started. These are some of the environmental justice issues, decreased quality of life. We had one, the hog facility that was shut down was shut down to quality of life. The three gentlemen living within 300 feet of 4,000 hogs all had heart problems, all had to have heart surgery. And the hydrogen sulfide is what shut it down for quality of life. The road damage, we've exceeded almost a half million dollars just in our county that the taxpayers have to pick up. Taxes, uh, I'm not sure what kind of uh, programs you have here in Wisconsin, but if they pay their taxes in Michigan, they get it all back except 3%. So it's not fair to the community or the schools or anyone in the counties. Um, dissension in the community. Like I said, you'll have people that will, were your friends forever, that will no longer be. I had a CAFO operator that was in my wedding 36 years ago who now calls me a terrorist. So you have to understand that when you take a stand, you've got to stand up for what's right. Surface and drinking water pollution, groundwater, illicit tile connections, irrigation. Um, the irrigation we found that with the dairies, uh, we have copper contamination of the groundwater because of the copper foot, they walk the cows through the copper foot baths. So they're adding chemicals. And any chemical is going into that is being sprayed into the air. And you're breathing it and you're eating it every time you breathe. Self-report. Reporting is almost non-existent. Leaking lagoons, siting, cleanup costs, permit compliance is almost unheard of and disease, virus, and bacteria, and pathogens. There's a website called US EPA Ag 101 Pathogens. It lists everything on there, including anthrax and all the different protozoas, the parasites and viruses and bacteria. This is a public health notification complaint form that we worked with with a doctor and registered nurse that we put online. And we made this for the rural community because these are the symptoms you will get from CAFOs. We delivered one of these to all 88 health departments in the state of Michigan and requested that citizens be allowed to use them when they file complaints. Okay, here's your good case study. Okay, this began in 2007 when a California dairyman, A.J. Boss, proposed to build what was said to be the largest dairy capo east of the Mississippi in northwest Illinois at the headwaters of the Apple, Canyon, Apple River Canyon State Park and in a very sensitive geological area characterized by bedrock karst, which is very susceptible to groundwater contamination. The operation was to have 5,500 head facilities with several 14-acre lagoons, one of which was a tap of spring-fed leading to the Apple River and the sensitive karst aquifer. The proposal divided the community right up from the bat. Those for and against the local group helping others maintain environmental standards or homes quickly organized what ensued was a five-year battle between Holmes and A.J. Boss. And I did a timeline so we could shorten this up. And you can see they did a notice of it to construct 
Um, they granted permits. They filed lawsuits against um, the Illinois Department of Ag and A.J. Boss. Boss started building the Army Corps required Clean Water Act permits. Clean Water Act 308 complaint was filed. Discovery of first numerous discharges. U.S. EPA initiates Clean Water Act. The judge denied the preliminary injunction. They filed an appeal. They refused to comply with the U.S. EPA. They had another silage discharge that was bright purple. I'm sure all of you have seen that online at some point. Um, the appellate court ruled against Holmes. The Supreme Court denied the review. They filed a complaint. Boss tells them he won't construct. There was a consent agreement with the U.S. EPA. There was a settlement, and the permit expired. What Holmes did to succeed, and these were the tools that were used. They organized, they gathered information, they built relationships, they took legal action, they did fundraising, they sought and addressed permits, they did media and public outreach, they did constant pressure on the responsible agencies, they did aerial surveillance, water monitoring, and they did not give up. This is a very depressing fight, and many people cannot handle what goes on. But this is your community, and it's your children. You have to do this. Thank you. Very much. Picture's a little sketchy. KFOs are definitely something that we need to be concerned about. And the KFO that's coming in here, the unfortunate thing is that the KFO is an immediate threat. And as a result, we need an immediate response from our community. And just going back to what Michelle said, we need everyone to get engaged. You know, start with Farms Not Factories, sign our pledge, donate some cash, help us get the word out, help us figure out how we can become than second story, because we don't want to become Kiwani, and I feel terrible every time I say that because Glenn and Nancy are friends of mine, but we don't want that to happen here, and we need people to get engaged, and what Sarah's going to do, Sarah Lloyd is our final speaker, she's a special projects coordinator for the Wisconsin Farmers Union, and Sarah's going to give us some yeses, because environmentalists love to say no, 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 and we're, Sarah's going to show us some things that we can do here right now that are going to make a difference for our community. <coughs> Oh, she's a farmer. Okay, okay. She's got kind of Hi. Uh, thanks so much for this opportunity here. Um, and I work with the Wisconsin Farmers Union, but I'm also a member of the Wisconsin Farmers Union. My husband and I dairy farm outside the Wisconsin Dells in Columbia County. Um, we farm with his family. We milk 400 cows, uh, and we're three families. Um, my husband, his name is Nels Nelson, so he's the last, last Norwegian bachelor farmer. <laughs> Actually, Olaf Christofferson lives around the corner, and he's still single. Uh, that's true, I'm not making that up. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but we farm, um, and multiple generation farm, uh, we ship our milk to Foremost Farms, which is a cooperative owned by the farmers. And um, for Wisconsin Farmers Union, both as someone who works for the organization, but as a member, as a farmer member, um, we work on legislation, we work on education, and we work on cooperation. And those are the three main areas. Um, and we were working for good, fair markets for farmers. And we're working for uh, economics and social relationships that support rural communities. And we also work for agriculture that works in concert with the land and supports the, and works in community with the land. So that's really what we're about. Um, and I think it's important, what I want to do with the time that I have with you tonight is just, you know, we think about what we're seeing, these horrible CAFOs, these devastating factory farms and I think it's really important to think a little bit about like well how did we get to this point like why are we seeing this 
Um, and, and so maybe that will help us think a little bit about our strategy too, because we definitely need to put these fires out that are popping up all over the place, but they're popping up because they're, they're, we've created these structures, these economic and political structures that are sort of forcing agriculture into this place. And so at the same time that we put the fires out, we also maybe can think about these structures and maybe we can chip away at them a little bit and open it up so that family farms can exist and can return a reasonable income for their families and can support vibrant rural communities like we perhaps saw in the past and even better than we saw in the past. So, you know, how did we get to a spot where these large scale confinement operations are positioned as the only thing that we can expect from agriculture? That's just kind of inevitable that we just have to be like, well, I guess there's nothing we can do, it just is how it is. Um, so let's really think about what's been going on in the last sort of 50 years or so to really push us in this direction. So these slides are really small, but you know, basically the story is we have a lot fewer farms <laughs> in Wisconsin, in the United States, but at the same time, so that's the, the dropping line on the, your left, <laughs> um, is the number of farms in the United States. And the rising line on the right is an index line of productivity. So we're really good at increasing our productivity, but we're losing the actual number of farms, the actual number of individual businesses, small businesses, that are active in the landscape, and that's important. And Wisconsin has seen you know, the same loss of farms. Um, it was really sad, I think it was last week or the week before, Wisconsin announced that we have dropped below 10,000 dairy farms. And it's funny because I am on some national dairy boards and um, like a lot of states only have a thousand dairy farms left or some states have a hundred. And so they're like, you have 10,000 dairy farms, what are you complaining about? And I'm like, well, five years ago we had 15,000 dairy farms. You know, and 20 years ago we had 60,000 dairy farms. So we're losing, I mean, it's going fast. And so we gotta figure out what to do to keep up people farming because it's important for our communities and it's important for the land. Um, so the other thing about this loss of farms that's pretty important to think about is that it's not, you know, it's not, we're not losing all the farms equally in like all the sizes. So shocker, we're getting a lot of big farms and we're losing all the middle farms, the middle scale, these are the family farms. Um, we, we do actually see an increase, and this is on the left-hand side, of, of the, real, the smaller farms, folks that, you know, maybe they're selling uh, vegetables or meat at a farmer's market, maybe they have a small CSA. Um, we are seeing an uptick in these smaller enterprises, um, but we're seeing a big uptick in the large scale, the folks that are moving the most value through the system, and we have a disappearing middle, and it's a crisis for farming communities, because that's the families that we're losing. Um, and I did just pull down the hog farm numbers for Wisconsin. I have to admit, um, I've spent a lot of time looking at dairy structures and dairy trajectories, so I, I'm not, we don't actually have that strong a history. I mean, there's not as much hog production in this sort of larger scale in Wisconsin, so this is really something to watch as it comes into the state. Um, what we can see is like the left-hand bar is uh, an operations with one to 24 pigs. So we actually see that um, in, and this is the 2007 is the orange on the left and 2012 is the green. So we actually saw that, you know, we had about 2,250 small, you know, smaller operations that had hogs, like one to 24 pigs. Um, and that's in all the different categories of, you know, things, operations that take them all the way to finish, operations that maybe just feral. Um, but it really gives you an idea that we, we have a lot of folks that are, you know, keeping 25 pigs, 10 pigs, things like that. Um, but what we're seeing is a drop off, definitely. We lost 29% of all the farms with hogs from the 2007 to the 2012 census. Um, so, uh, and the dairy is similar. We have actually, this is showing you uh, one to 19 cow herds, 20 to 49, 
50 to 99 cows in a herd, 100 to 199, 200 cows to 499, and on up. And the, what you see really dramatically is in the 50 to 99 cow herds, we are losing uh, thousands, 1,500 in just five years, and we saw a total loss of 22% of our dairy herds during the five years of the U.S. Census. So it's going really quick, um, and these businesses and these families are fundamental for our rural communities, and they're fundamental for how we care for the land um, and how we manage the nutrients and the manure that comes from the animals uh, into the cropping system. So it's really important that we have these farms. We still have an average dairy size of under, or just around 100 cows. The average farm in Wisconsin is still 100 cows. Um, but we have 12,000 cow dairies in Wisconsin now where we didn't before. Um, so, you know, this is something that we need to watch. Okay, but, so what's going on? Why are we seeing this? Why are we losing all of our family farmers? Uh, and let's think about some strategies, you know, when we're thinking about this of how we might kind of break some of these cycles or make some structures that will actually support family farmers. First of all, like this is a corn yield ma uh, graph from 1907 to 2007, it's bushels per acre. We're really, really good with the use of technology in increasing our yields. And if I put wheat up there or milk per cow or you know, pork pounds per animal, they would look exactly the same. We've done a really good job with science, with the university, with technology of figuring out how to increase our productivity and our yield. So, you know, that's one reason that we're seeing a lot of production. Um, but what's happening with farmers is that what we're being, what we're being told to do to get this great productivity, because that's the goal, you know, that's how everything's being measured, is that we need to put all these inputs. So we need fertilizer, we need seed, we need farm machinery, we need chemicals, we need animal feed, and guess what? The cost for those inputs is rising rapidly. And the farmers are the ones that are needing to pay that. So we've got increased input costs, um, but when we're trying to then go sell the product that we're much better at producing and we're doing much more efficiently, what we're doing is we're really hitting concentration in the industry, so we're having difficulty getting our product into the markets um, at a price that's fair, because we don't, we're producing this big surplus of product, but then all of a sudden we try to go sell it, and we have fewer and fewer entities that we can sell it to, and guess what? They control the pricing, they control the distribution, they control the processing, they control the, the sales and retail. So this is just shows you this measure of concentration in the industry, which is called the CR4. So, you know, hog, um, hogs are Smithfield is obviously really strong, um, but in total in packing, and that's for the processing of hogs, for example, they say 67% of the hog packing is controlled by just four companies. And that means you have major concentration in the industry, and that means it's difficult for farmers to get in there, and they become more and more price takers. So then what do you do when you continually like, can't get your product sold, you're trying to get it sold? Um, I'll go back to this. Is This is what happens to you. You get on a treadmill. And I'll tell you personally that, so my husband, Nels Nelson, the Nelson family, we farm, we're on the treadmill. I should fix this slide and put us all on there, like the six of us and the, the nieces and nephews. Because what happens is, like you're trying to make some money and your input costs are going way up and you can't find a good price. So what do you, somebody tells you to do, they're like, well, why don't you just milk some more cows? Or why don't you build another barn for hogs? And then that way, you'll have more units to sell. Even though you have a smaller margin, you'll, you'll get ahead. And the bank will lend you money to put the extra barn in, or the bank will lend, lend you money to put the par milking parlor in. But then what do you have to do? You gotta run a little bit faster, and you gotta milk a little bit more, and you gotta raise some more hogs or pharaoh some more, um, and that's what we get stuck on. So this is what's happening to the farmers. 
And so, you know, what are people, what are their choices? Like a lot of them just like fall off the back of the treadmill because they cannot keep it up. Or other people kind of move into that large scale because that's the only thing that they can figure out how to keep themselves and their family on the land. And I'm not gonna apologize for that because there's no excuse for 30,000 cow dairies or you know, 50,000 hog operations that are dumping nutrients into people's drinking water. So I'm not trying to apologize for that. I just think it's really important that we sort of understand what's causing this. Um, and then, you know, we have this general situation in the United States that we have an ideology of productivism. What are we trying to do? Feed the world. Like all production, more production is always going to be good. Like that's the message that's out there. And it's pretty difficult to be like, oh, I don't want to feed the world. Well, I actually don't want to feed the world. And I think I'd like to help the world feed itself. So I don't really need to be talking about that. But this is what's happening to farmers. And these are the pressures. And you know, they get the glossy magazines and they go to the shows and they tell you you need to buy the bigger combine. And you know, it's amazing. Like the steak dinners are really nice from the seed dealers and they really give you nice <laughs> baseball caps and, and nice jackets and things. And I mean, seriously, it's, it's like you gotta fit into the group and be part of that because you know, this is generations building this situation. Um, but you know, so in the end, what happens, this is something that the National Farmers Union updates every month. Um, I realize my slide has a 2013 numbers, but basically it'll show you a, a suite of products that you buy in the retail store and what the, is, you're kind of paying on average in the United States in the retail store and what the farmer is getting paid. So, you know, for a pound of sirloin steak, you may be paying $7.99 a pound, the farmer's getting $2.09. Um, you know, cereal, <laughs> you're paying $4.19 for that air, and the farmer's getting paid six cents. Um, but basically what it comes out to be is that the farmer and the rancher is only receiving about 16 cents of every dollar that's spent in the retail market. So, you know, when people start seeing like milk prices go up or pork prices go up, you know, they're like, oh, those damn farmers, they're making so much money. Well, not a lot, of, like a lot of farmers aren't very, making very much money. And, and so there's, you know, we really need to think about these supply chains and kind of, you know, how can we engage in them? And, you know, this is an activity that we can do. You know, if you can tighten up those supply chains going to the farmer's market, maybe you're a <coughs> member of a CSA, maybe you're a farmer that's doing a CSA, um, maybe you're in a cooperative, the Wisconsin uh, Farmers Union started a new cooperative with 35 vegetable farmers in Wisconsin, and we're aggregating truckloads of fresh vegetables and selling them into the Roundy's grocery store chain, which is a 160 store chain. And we're kind of trying to do those logistics together as farmers so that we can get decent prices and we can get our product in the market and we can get good food to the eater. that can you know vote with our fork and and put us in some more power in this situation uh and so you know these are kind of the yeses like what is it that we can say yes to about agriculture in the future so what we work for in the wisconsin farmers union and what i work for every day on my farm is that we want a structure that supports economic democracy. And it's essential that we have as many farms as possible because these are small businesses, they're active in their communities, they're economic engines, but they're social relationship engines. And we really need to like pull away this kind of black box of agricultural production. We need to all get in there and understand like what our relationships are to the different people. And that includes the person in the supermarket and the distributor and the processor and we're you know everyone needs their piece of the pie right now it's really unequal that's the issue the farmers aren't getting much you're getting crappy food in the store and somebody's making a big ton of money in the middle and they're not sharing 
just share. That's all I want. <laughs> uh, but you know, we want more farmers on the land because more farmers on the land means that you know more farmers are paying attention to the land intimately because they care. So we milk 400 cows. We run a thousand acres. We can feed all of those 400 cows with the thousand acres of land that we grow. We can manage our crop rotations and we do spread the manure, but we like live right there and we need to deal with it. And we've been in that community for many, many generations. because it provides the ability to have a full cycle, the nutrients. Um, so we can do this. We want transport, transparent value chains that value all the people in, the, in the, the, the value chain, as I said. And we want farm systems that support ecological systems and do not create risk for ecological systems. So that's really what we're trying to do and what I hope you're trying to do. And we need to fight the fires but we also need to articulate and activate a vision that we want to be part of. And we are part of it every day because we're all eating food every day and that makes us part of agriculture. Um, so I really appreciate this time with you and I think we've got a lot of uh, good things that we can do together to restore the social relationships and, and, and get the economic relationships, relationships back into the social relationships rather than the other way around where the economic relationships are dominating everything and squishing out the social relationships. So we can do that. Um, but yeah, you do have a fight on your hands <laughs> uh, with putting out the fires. And so I definitely encourage you to do that. Um, I actually have a really special guest with me that I managed to coax into my car for the drive up <laughs> from the Dells. And um, I want to bring her over here. Uh, Salver Young's daughter is here, and she's Icelandic, but she lives in Madison some days. But what she represents is the fact that, unfortunately, this is an international problem for our rural communities. And Salver and her family have been fighting a hog CAFO in Iceland for 16, 16 years. Um, and I want her to give you a little Thank you, Sarah, and thanks everyone for, um, I thought just sitting up here with the dignitaries was honor enough for me. I'm just so pleased to be here with uh, all these great folks that have been, you know, doing extraordinary things in fighting these horrible things that CAFO is. I'm not going to take much of your time since we are all, you know, you know, waiting for the pies, etc. But um, just since I'm up here, I can just briefly tell you my story and, and try to keep it to like two sentences. Uh, Iceland, as you know, is a tiny island in the North Atlantic, about the size of Kentucky, I believe, and the population is 300,000, so it's like uh, Madison. And uh, you wouldn't think you need a big cave over there, neither did I. But when uh, my, uh, my, our, I grew up on a family farm on the southwestern coast of Iceland, and when um, our neighbor sold his farm, a uh, uh, big invest, you know, uh, fa factory farmer, he calls himself a farmer, he's just a factory owner from the Reykjavik area. He was uh, in that area already with some uh, poultry and hawk uh, factories. Uh, bought the farm to put up there uh, a factory for 25,000 hawks. Uh, we, this was in 99. Uh, we fought that for two years, but we lost that battle. So he has that factory up and running, and actually he, bri he bribes about it himself that he's the biggest uh, food producer, he calls it, in Iceland, uh, since he has 30,000 uh, hogs there. He is, well, however, his permit is only for 25,000. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is how, how they work. And um, I can just tell you that, you know, in the, you know, 16 years ago, when uh, my family, uh, we stuck together. My parents gave up on their family farm. Uh, they, they couldn't handle it. Uh, he was calling them up, calling them names, writing letters to the government, you know, the Ministry for Animal, calling them the, the, the sheep uh, mines, um, my neighbors, the sheep mines, because, you know, my farm, they had a classical uh, uh, sheep and dairy farm. Um, 
And they just said, we can't deal with this. We've been here, uh, my mom was in charge of, you know, the musical, uh, you know, life in the, in the county, and my dad was, you know, on the county board and all that. My grandma was the midwife of the, of the district, etc. They were really, really, you know, typical farmers active in the community. And um, so they said, we can't, we can't deal with this. Uh, then the, the sad part of this story is, and that's my message to you, please stick together. There was no one that supported them. No one except our, our little family. But, so um, they, um, they decided to quit farming and move to Reykjavik, the, the city. Um, and they said, we're gonna sell the farm. And we said, hell no, you're not gonna sell the farm. I'm born there, you're not selling this place. And they said, what can we do? No one's gonna buy it. Said, well, we'll take it over. So we are four sisters that own it now. And uh, my sisters and I, we are, thank you. I mean, someone has to fight this, and it does, you know, people get all sorts of diseases. This is what happened to us. We just have to deal with this, we have to fight it, and we have to fight it. And we are, and amongst us, we are four sisters and, you know, four uh, brothers-in-law. Uh, we have uh, one veterinarian, two biologists, uh, one MD. I'm a, I'm a degree is in urban regional planning or land use planning. So we had a quite a team. Uh, well, and, but that is not a given. That is not a given. It just so happened we could take this on. And we had to do it on our own, by ourselves. No one was helping us. And there was no people like Scott and Lynn and Michelle, you know, you can go to. Um, so we lost a lot of battles. You know, our initial um, uh, fight against it was based on the sustainable development. You know, this thing is going against all the three pillars of sustainability. The econo economical one, the environmental one, and the social one. It's going to ruin all these three pillars. And I wrote all this down, and I had, you know, like long letters, letters, you know, supporting and, uh, you know, um, um, pieces from the literature supporting uh, what I was saying. But, you know, of course, the local government said, well, we can, you know, this is the future. I remember, I always remember, this is the future. Yeah, this is the future. Because, and it doesn't have to be your future, I said. Well, they say, no, well, you know, we can't stop it. This is his land. And I, we said, well, this is our land. You're going to ruin it. Well, but we lost that battle. The factory is there. But after 10 years, uh, well, we needed a lawyer in the family. So we said to the oldest uh, grandkid, <laughs> you are going to law school, <laughs> which he did. And, and he's a, when he uh, uh, was, became a lawyer, he said, we should take this to court. And I, I also got another good friend who was a planning lawyer on board. So we took it to the court and we won in, and we actually claimed that, you know, the reduction of our property was such that we could live there, which was the truth. And we won in Supreme Court, I mean, in um, Circuit Court. Uh, the local government didn't want to um, accept that and took it to the Supreme Court and we also won there. So at least we won that battle, but I can tell you this. This, the, the, the war is still going on. Uh, just, I think it was before yesterday, I was writing to the local um, health inspector because he is not really on our side, but much so on the other side. And he, you know, there are, like, or there are tanks that are open, they're supposed to be closed. He has, um, um, you know, the, I can go on and on and on. He has dead pigs in co open containers. And we are on the shore, like I told you, so there are seabirds all over. And the birds don't realize where, you know, the boundary is. So they will go onto our farm, where we are actually still breeding horses. That's the only farming we are doing and just raising uh, vegetables for the family. So I'm a, I was, this is a letter I was writing the uh, day before yesterday. So battle goes on and on and on. And the only, you know, and the lesson is uh, all what I said in the initial letter 16 years ago, uh, trying to stop this thing about that this was going to ruin the, you know, economy. Because of course he has, oh, now he's, I think there, there are like nine hog farmers left in the country. Because he's, he is, you know, he has like 60% of the market or probably more now. Uh, the workers at the farms are two <coughs> poor people from Eastern Europe that are willing to accept his salaries. I mean, so that's what it brings to the economy. And, and socially, it brings nothing to the community. I can tell you, there, you know, he, of course, lives in Reykjavik. He is not in charge of the musical, uh, you know, work in the, in the county, or neither is he on the county board. He doesn't do anything. It doesn't want, of course, he doesn't want to live there. Who wants to live there, you know, on this farm? Uh, so 
please stick together, work together, join the groups, and remember, this is going to affect everyone. It's going to affect the environmental, the economical, and the social aspect of your community if it comes in. So please, please stop it before it's too late. And I know you're a wonderful group of, of people that can work together, so good luck. Thank you to, for all the all the presenters and and I want to I want to apologize. There's one other person I, I, I left off in the introduction set so I could you could rem remember her better, um, like I did with Steve Sandstrom and that's Steve uh, D. Yost. We've also partnered with uh, D. Yost with the uh, Washburn Area Time Bank, which is just starting up this month, right. and so that's an exciting um, event. We all have talents we'd like to serve. The nice thing about this, you don't just give; you also get something in return. The nice thing about it also is that all hours are created equal. Um, an hour of my time is the same hour as uh, somebody else's this time who may be much more creative and talented than I, so I, but we also, we exchange friendship and it's a nice opportunity. So it's an opportunity to, to share time. Um, we have a booth out there as well for the, uh, um, there's a table outside to get an application. There's also one at the resource reuse store, which is kind of their semi-office um, for the Washburn Area Time Bank. So uh, many thanks to D. Yost for uh, getting that set up in this area with a Bremer Foundation grant, and we're looking forward to seeing that expand in the years ahead. Um, so thank you. Um, and I see you in the time bank, so please forgive me, Dave, wherever you are. Um, Steve, if you want to come up and, and see the panel. Thank you. Get this up to my height here. <laughs> How's that? Get the old still. Okay, there we go. Well, one more round of applause, I think, to the information <laughs> story. Really uh, my role tonight is to be a, sort of a moderator of a question and answer session. And um, what we did, instead of a very often we'll just ask for questions out of the audience, but a little different uh, scenario this time. We actually put a, a question out on our Facebook page to ask people to bring questions forward. Uh, the members of our board did the same thing. And so I have a list, and then what I'm gonna try to do is based on what was already said during the presentation, I'm gonna try to pick the questions that hit the areas that maybe didn't get uh, answered uh, originally. So all of this that's been discussed tonight obviously is extremely important. It's the, the whole CAFO issue is the a current uh, serious issue in our community. You know, we, but we just dodged a bullet recently with uh, the mine that was proposed. Uh, some of you might remember just a few years ago with the uh, fly-in gated community proposal that was set up here in the our, our uh, orchard country up here and that one we were able to keep out as well but what struck me was about what was talked about tonight is that pretty much any of these other issues could be um, affected in a positive way by many of the things that our group talked about it's the kinds of things that we need to do in our communities and so I'm going to ask a couple of questions that maybe are a little bit more general um, that people had asked uh, uh, earlier, and I'd like the members of the panel to respond, any or all, for these questions. Um, so the first one, and which one was it? If a person could take only one action as a member of the community, what one act would you encourage them to take? Don't all raise your hand at once. I think the, the first and the best thing that anybody could do is, is choose where your food purchases are coming from. You know, if you don't purchase the food that these CAFOs are producing, 
they will not exist. If you're purchasing your food from your local farmers, you support your local economy and your local farmers, and then there is no need for a CAFO to come to your community. Any other responses to that one? Good. I think probably the best thing that you could do in your community is to really create an awareness and educate your community about what this means to all of you. And you really are the responsible party here. A lot of times people get the idea that it's going to be the Department of Natural Resources or the EPA or your health department or the lawyer that you pick out that's going to come in and be the advocate for you that you think is going to make the change. But this is a full tent full of people here tonight. And I really want you to believe me when I say that you really are responsible for the fate of your community. And I hope that all of you, when you're out and about talking to your family and friends, that you're discussing this, that you are going wherever you have to go to, to learn and educate yourself. And, um, and please write letters to the editors and just be discussing this as much as you can so that you can be the people that are behind the steering wheel of this, what could be a drastic event coming to your lives and your community. Thank you. I, I was Go just going to add one more thing. One Go thing ahead. that uh, we can all do is we can all vote. We can all vote very educated. Uh, we have a lot of help, the League of Women Voters, League of Conservation Voters. They will help us make good decisions. And uh, we should all remember as Americans that on this, on this planet, people live and die every day fighting for the right to vote. And it is, it is an absolute gift that we have in this country. So I, I, I agree with one of Nancy's statements and vote. You know, vote with your food dollars and vote with your ballot. Okay. Thank you. Next question. How do we help members of our community connect with what they truly value? and understand how factory farms or other serious environmental issues interact with or compromise these values. You want to tackle that one? Um, here locally, uh, if you haven't been to the website Words for Water, uh, this was started by Mary Doherty, and uh, it is an extremely powerful website. She goes to folks in the community and she says, what do you value? What do you value about living in this community? And it always comes back to the lake, to the clean water, to the clean air, to the quality of life. She gives them a chalkboard, and uh, she loves dogs, so if you got a dog, the dog's gonna be in the picture. <laughs> she takes you to the shore of Lake Superior, and you write down on that chalkboard what you believe what, about water, uh, the, the sanctity of water, the fact that this is 10% of the fresh water on the planet. And uh, it's, a, it's an extremely powerful testimony. And that was done several months before this debate over these hogs coming in was done. And what it did is it asked folks in this community, why is this place special? Why have you chosen to live here? And I, I just, I commend her highly for really refocusing this community on what they truly value. And it is this beautiful treasure, Lake Superior, that you are so fortunate to live beside. There is no compromise. In my community where people can't drink their water, is that the compromise that you want to make? And the people in my community that are afraid to take a shower because it might get them sick if they have a cut on their leg, is that a compromise that you want to make? 
there is no compromise for clean water. And that includes for us farmers. We must provide clean water for our neighbors. It is imperative for all of us. So there is no compromise on clean water or clean air. We must just create that and keep that. So there is no compromise. Other comments on that one? Okay. I know this is a broad question, but this is, uh, uh, we've had several questions that were similar to this one. Uh, what steps can we take to create such thriving communities that is issues such as this, those discussed tonight, become obsolete? That's a great question, and I think that the last slide that I put up, I think to really think about the socioeconomic, the social and the economic interactions around the agriculture, because I, you know, we, we should demand and are demanding as citizens that farmers, you know, keep their operations at a scale that's not creating these on, um, unacceptable risks and but we need to also be able to create a system that can actually support people with a reasonable return on their work so that they can support their family and that all the other people in the supply chain are supported so I think that we do need to do some homework um, and really try to build up robust supply chains that support people and value people. Um, and so that's on us, you know, to, to, to recreate or, or enact those new supply chains. Um, because, it, you know, again, then you get kind of stuck in these, like, well, no, I don't like that, I don't like that, I don't like that. Well, you know, I like an agriculture that supports people. Well, what does that look like? Like, how much does a farmer need to get paid for their pig? or their milk to be able to actually reasonably cover their cost of production. And you know, maybe I need to buy a used car every five years <laughs> to, to continue to be able to go to my community events. And maybe I want to save some money so my son or daughter can go to college. Like those should be reasonable expectations. And the same way that I think everyone in the community should have a reasonable expectation to have a livelihood um, that is works. Um, and so we do need to do our homework and figure out those pricing points. And if if people, you know, a lot of people say, oh, we can't afford, people can't afford to eat the healthy food and the organic food. And that's very, very true. But let's get people's wages up then so that they can afford to pay that price because that's a price that has a better chance of actually covering the costs and let's get the concentration out of the seed markets and the input markets so that farmers aren't being completely uh i was going to swear but i won't uh <laughs> so that farmers aren't getting you know having to pay insane prices for everything and not covering their costs so i think you know that's our homework and, and we can do that, and let's keep everybody supported in the community. Anyone else add to that? Okay. I seem to add a lot on these things. <laughs> I think just to add on to what Sarah was saying is, we all have to realize we've already paid for our food before we ever walk into the grocery store. You're paying for your food first, with your tax dollars, then you're paying at the grocery store. If we would eliminate the subsidy system that is making it so that only certain crops are viable for the farmers, and most of those crops are not actually even food for people, if we can eliminate those subsidies, then we could actually start paying the farmer for the food, not just for these crops that have nothing to do with our health and our community's health. So we need to get the one 
let's get rid of the taxes that we're paying first for our food and let's just all pay the real price which is actually what that organic food really is you know if you eliminate the subsidies for the current food system everybody's on a level playing field and you're not paying any more for the organic and the healthy and the local so get rid of the subsidies get rid of the taxpayer welfare that is going out for so many farmers right now and make it so they can make a decent living. All right, this is a, a little different uh, twist here, but it's, uh, I think it's really important to not just this issue, but all community issues. What are some examples that you have experienced or heard about of effective ways to engage youth or our younger generation in issues and initiatives of sustainability and community vibrancy. Are there any? <laughs> I think getting young people on the land is really important. Very young, grade school. Um, get children in the soil playing, planting. Um, Witnessing the awesomeness of a seed turning into a plant, which always amazes me. It doesn't matter how old I am. That's really, really important. And it's also really important to engage your children in activities that I engage my children in, which they're not always happy about, but they do go to board meetings. They do go to um, public hearings with us that engage them in in the process of what's happening in our community. So I think the really important thing for children is always that they have a good mentor, and they certainly can, uh, even in the grocery store, be brought to recognize what is a highly processed food uh, that lacks nutrition, and, and a product that is nutrient dense, that has been raised with humane animal husbandry practices, and that has been good to the land, to the animals, to the farmer, to your community and the planet. So you are the mentor for, for tomorrow's children that are growing up now. Thanks. Other comments? Okay. Yeah. One of the things that I do in Michigan is I train the youth in the classes at the schools and we go out and water monitor. I try and get them to understand, uh, send bottles home with them to test their home water and get them acclimated as to where their water comes from, whether it's well water, city water, what's in the water, you know, talk the teacher into a trip to the treatment plant or the drinking water plant so they can understand what's going to be in their future. So we have uh, fifth graders down in Dundee by Lake Erie who every year we go out with three different classes and they post the results online and these kids are excited to know what's in their water. So this is one of the ways I get kids involved on the ground. All right, the, uh, some of you have been to our community before, others have only been here a short time, um, but from your visit or for what you've heard about our community, are there strengths that you see that you think will be helpful in moving forward with issues like this? And are there weaknesses that you think we need to really closely look at in our community that will make it easier for these things to happen? Uh, I first came to Bayfield, uh, I believe it was 1986, 1987, I've been, uh, it had been almost uh, 25 years since I'd come back, and I've been here several times in the last few months. Um, the cohesiveness of this community really, truly amazes me. Uh, when, you, when you live in a place like Bayfield County, uh, or the town of Bayfield, where the road literally ends in uh, the world's largest inland ocean, it takes very special people to uh, live there, and the um, 
just the few days that I've been in town on this trip, uh, the sense of community. When you, you know, people, you know, they say I talk funny up here. I think y'all talk funny up here too. Um, but they, they're interested. Folks are very interested. They're friendly. They're, they want to know why you're here. And so I tell them and we start talking about this. And I haven't ran into a single person yet that said, you know, I think, uh, you know, 20 some thousand hogs out here is a great idea. It'd be fantastic. So I, I think the sense of community that you have is just uh, something truly special. And it's something that is not found everywhere else. And I would just, again, as several of the speakers have said, encourage you to really cleave together as a community. I mean, one of the things that I hate worst about what happened to my community, uh, you know, where we have now 80,000 hogs, we raised, as Michelle said, two and a half million in a five county area. Those communities have been ripped completely apart. People have been excommunicated from churches. They have to change where they shop for groceries. Families that have lived beside each other for 130, 140, 150 years won't even speak to each other anymore over this issue. Do not let that happen to these, these Northern Tier counties that are truly so special. You are really a special breed of people. Unique, unique in America. And uh, as one of the board supervisors up here from Ashland County said, you know, you're living on 10% of the world's fresh water and as he said, maybe we should start acting on it. So cleave together as a community. Do not let this tear you asunder. As somebody that's been here several times here in the last few months, uh, I'm amazed at the talent that your community has. Uh, utilize that to it, its full extent. Don't let if there's anybody in your community that wants to do anything to help out, let them do it. Don't, don't tell them that they can't do anything. Uh, you've got so, so many talented people here. I, I think the one big issue that you need to get out to your community is that this is not the same type of farming as what your grandfathers did. I think this is what is really hard for your community, and I hear it quite often is that you know, well, it's just farming. Well, this is not just farming. And I think that is the hardest thing that people have to come to grips with. This is not just farming. It's completely different. It's a, uh, there's so much massive amounts of waste, so, much, so many uh, negative connotations that go with this compared to traditional farming. That I think that's the one big issue that you have to get out there is the difference between traditional farming and what this is actually about. The speed that Mary Doherty and the beginning of the people who started the movement here has been incredible. We have been in this struggle for a really long time, over a decade. And the fact that uh, you formed a strong uh, group really quickly that um, Farms Not Factories was created, and everybody in this room really needs to know, your moratorium is amazing. And not only that, you need to know that people throughout the state of Wisconsin cheered that you did that. I don't know if you all know that you moved a mountain, but you did. And a whole lot of people cheered you on for that. In our community, we just were in total awe, and you just had so many cheerleaders through the state, and all I can say is keep going, keep doing what you're doing. You've already done things that other people have failed at, and, uh, and now, in fact, the DNR is not even responsible for um, your fate, is what I understand. It's been handed over to the EPA, so even in that regard, I, I feel that you're in better hands, that the EPA is, is overlooking this right now for you. So you guys are doing a great job. Just a tiny, tiny uh, add to that is, you know, it was not only the people of Wisconsin that, you know, were um, uh, celebrating your moratorium. I emailed, uh, because I followed what was going up here, I emailed to all of my family members and they said, can't you Im export those people to Iceland? <laughs> All right.
right, at the risk of repeating everything, I know we want to get to pie really quickly, but I want to echo, again, that you have board, you know, supervisors that are listening to you, that hit the pause button. That's unheard of. Normally when I'm in communities, it's, I hear story after story about how the county commissioners are bought and paid for, they're CAFO owners themselves, they provide grain to CAFOs. So the fact that you have supervisors that have put a moratorium in place and are listening is amazing, and you should be in conversation with them about what's the next step and how can you give them political cover to do what you feel is necessary to protect the community. And like others have said as well, once a county puts in a really strong ordinance that's protective, you'll start to see other counties do the same thing. We've seen this in other states. So good for your elected officials for their leadership and just keep on trucking. I'm going to put an open invitation out because I know you people care because I will give tours of anyone that wants to make the trip to Michigan to see Lake Erie because I want you to picture your water out here as being bright green instead of blue like it is. All right, we'll conclude with that. Thank you so much. One more round of applause for our One little last thing, to, a couple little last things, but I've got one. Outside here, just about 20 feet from the opening of the tent, you're going to see some buckets with some questions above them. It's a little simple survey project here where you just take a little wood, a little wood wafer here that's in a bin out there, and just if you agree to that with that question, just stick it in that bin, all right? So a quick little survey, if you wouldn't mind doing that as you head off to the pies. And Christina's got one other thing. Yeah, don't run away, because I'm actually giving away prizes here. Um, I want to make a quick announcement that those people that stop by the Sierra Club, we do have some winners of those prizes. So Jack Knight, Stephanie Maud, I believe, Colleen Geyser, and Joanne Collins. Please stop by the Alliance web uh, table, we have them. We also have some glasses on, I know, I know, it's the pie, it's the pie. We have some glasses that you would, um, if you found in the geo, they, they have been able to find in the fossil record where animal husbandry, husbandry started in the first place. I have a suggestion. We're welcoming the Anthropocene. How about we leave in the geological record a little place called Schwamigan Bay where we set a marker of what feeding ourselves can look like. Can you show the Schwamigan Bay way of expressing our appreciation for these people that are clearly dedicating their lives to making a difference? Thank you.